Raise your hand. So we're going to try to make this as orderly as possible because I'm sure more than a few of you do have questions. And those questions would only come from members of the press club and working media. And our guest is the former governor, Edwin Washington Edwards, the only man in American history to be governor for 16 years, a U.S. congressman for seven years, a city councilman for eight years, and to have served eight years in federal prison. He's had uh, a remarkable life, and he's here to talk about the future rather than the past. And here he is, Governor Edwards. Haven't had this much attention since the trial. <laughs> <laughs> and now as then, I expect to go away after this. Except this time, I'm going to Washington, D.C. <laughs> I thank you for the invitation and for affording me this opportunity. And also I want to apologize to a number of you because I know during the past several weeks you have repeatedly made some effort to get to talk to me about this. And I apologize for not being able to accommodate to you. It's inconsistent with my general attitude towards the press. But frankly, until recently I had not made a firm decision. And I had promised everybody who talked to me that I would not give a prior release until I did make a decision and that's why I'm here today. Hopefully all of you can participate rather than one or two getting some advance notice and I hope you'll understand that. <clears throat> there, you know, I've given a great deal of thought to this. this. I've read articles and pundits from people who suggested what I should and should not do. And I acknowledge that there are good reasons why I should not run. I know that. But there are better reasons why I should. And good reasons have to give way to better reasons. Therefore, I will be a candidate for Congress from the 6th Congressional District this year. Among the many inquiries I got, is a question about whether or not I can run. Let me put that to rest. The first article of the United States Constitution apparently states the qualifications for running for Congress. You must be over 25 years old, <laughs> and clearly I meet that qualification. <laughs> you must be a citizen of the United States for over seven years. I was born and reared and lived in Louisiana all my life. I clearly meet that qualification. And the other thing is that you must be an inhabitant of the state from which you're running at the time of your election. I don't know what that means you could run from another state and then move in at the time, but that's irrelevant because I've been here all my life and I've lived in the sixth district for 41 years. I have children living in Livingston Parish, grandchildren living in there. Same in Baton Rouge. Trina and I live in Ascension, <coughs> so do some of my children. Two of my children, actually. I forgot about Eli. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, once and for all, without the question, I am qualified to run. When I was in Congress, in the late 60s and early 70s. There was a congressman from New, Orleans, from New York named Adam Clayton Powell, who was in some kind of difficulty back home. And the Congress of the United States, after his election, had attempted to refuse him admission into the Congress. In the famous case of Adam Powell versus McCormick, who was then the Speaker of the House, and I knew them both, the Supreme Court said what the qualifications are as articulated in the Constitution and went on to say that no addition or greater requirements should be made or could be made by any state. Powell versus McCormick set the stage and his progeny have clearly established that that's where it is and so once and for all I am positive I can run and I'm confident I can win. Now, I know that some people 
Right. Probably many people worried about my age. Well, there's a guy in Florida, 101 years old, running. <laughs> and by the time I'm his age, I'll be in my seventh term. <laughs> 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 I'll address that issue straight on. It should not be an issue. Younger candidates should not be penalized because of their youth and inexperience. <laughs> Therefore, their age should not be an issue in this campaign, and I will not make it an issue. <laughs> well, probably all of them could beat me in a foot race. But friends, this is a political race and you can expect the outcome to be different. Now, <clears throat> I served this state for many years. I assume that I'm well known, and I hope that my record will justify people considering supporting me, but I have plans. I'm very interested in running for Congress because <coughs> I feel, I feel, that I can accomplish something, if not immediately, but in the long run, to help make my country a better country and to pro probably address the needs and issues of the 6th District. What do I stand for? Number one, I intend to get on the Public Works Committee and on the Agricultural Committee. Why? Because the petrochemical industry, the Mississippi River, and other infrastructure very important to the development of this area. I'm very familiar with that and I want to be able to be in a position of influence to help. In that regard, I intend to try to recoup the $80 million that the government once provided for us, which our governor refused to accept, to initiate a study for some high-speed transportation system between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Not going to happen in my lifetime, but I think we need to study the proposition and determine the feasibility and where it should be established. <coughs> in addition to that, I've been talking to General Honoré and others about the aquifer in this area. Many people do not realize it, but the fresh water level is, be is beginning to lower itself. <coughs> and we want to try to work with industry to use more water from the Mississippi River and less from the freshwater aquifer. Long range, but it's something that needs to be addressed, and I intend to start on it. I'm also familiar with the needs and desires of farmers, the sugar cane, soybean, cotton, other farm enterprises that are important to the economy of this area and important to the job market. And I will be working with farmers to make things better for them. That, of course, is easy to say, creates no serious problem. But there will be issues in the campaign that no matter what position you take, there will be some criticism. Look, I did not vote for Obama. Where I was at the time, there were no voting machines. <laughs> <laughs> but I would not have voted for Obamacare had I been in Washington. Not because I do not agree with the intent of the legislation, but because I feel, and, and history has proven me correct, that it is too fraught with pitfalls and unknown dangers. <clears throat> and does not as was promised, allow people to maintain and keep their insurance if they're satisfied with it. And that's an unfortunate bad development. On the other hand, the Supreme Court has validated the legislation. It is the law, and we're going to have to deal with it, at least until Obama is out of office, because it will not be repealed during his term. Having said that, I think there's some provisions of the act which are very good. I think that people with pre-existing conditions should not be deprived of the opportunity of getting insurance. I think people who have children in college or dependent upon them should be able to stay on that policy <clears throat> until they're 26 years old. I think the issue of portability is a good one. Why should a person have to keep 
his or her job in order to keep his or her insurance. He or she should be allowed to get another employment and maintain the coverage they had initially. We should allow people to buy insurance across state lines. Maybe they can get a better deal in some other state. And that should be an option that people have. So I'm going to work with other people in the Congress to try to get those amendments made at least until we can make an, an addressment on the general issue of Obamacare. Now, on a controversial nature, among the good reasons in the, in the bill is one which provides for Medicaid coverage for people. Thank you. <laughs> For people who are underemployed, unemployed, children without adequate health care service, and old people who have limited income. Three to four hundred thousand people in this state are in one or more of those categories. The government will pay for the cost of the insurance for those people for three years, 100%. And thereafter, 90% or more. For some reason, the governor of this state has declined to accept the benefits of that program. That's his decision. I disagree with him. Now, if you're not one of those bleeding hearts who believe the words of Jesus is contained in the book of Matthew, that we should care for the least of these, and in so doing, we're caring for him, then I'll give you as a conservative a reason why you should be for the program. Because if these people in 2014 suffer from some dread disease, a horrible accident, they're not gonna sit home and writhe in pain and wait to die. They'll show up at the emergency room where hospitals are required by law to take them whether they can pay or not. Two things will happen to you. If you need to go to the emergency room, you'll get there and find it crowded with people who cannot otherwise get coverage. And second, since the hospital may not charge them, the amount of the bills will be factored into your bill and you and or your insurer will end up paying for the service. Nothing at all is more important to me than the life of a child. <clears throat> Nothing is more important to me than the ability of people in this time and age to be able to get treatment from rare diseases. And I'm going to work in Congress in an effort to try to override the governor's decision. Don't know that I can, don't know that there's a possibility, but I'm going to try because I cannot go to bed at night knowing that there are three to 400,000 people in this state who may need help who are not getting it, and it is available. The money we save the government by not participating in the program to help our citizens will end up helping the citizens of other states, something I'm sure that our governor is concerned about given his frequent visits there. <laughs> <coughs> I've always been concerned about the health care of our citizens. We built three hospitals while I was governor and modernized every other hospital, including big charity, which for reasons not necessary to go into, is now no longer big charity. Well, I know, I know that the role that I take today is an important one. It's important to me and my family and to my friends. But I want you to know that I'm going to give it every effort and hope that in so doing, I can end up being the congressman from this district and hopefully lend some peace and quiet to all the acrimony that goes on in Washington. I, I don't understand. When I was in Congress, that Democrats and Republicans met in principle compromise and got things done. Now it's one fight after the other. <laughs> if the president is for something, 
this group is against it, if this group is for it, another group is against it, and all they do is argue and, and complain and cry and nothing is accomplished. I like to believe that based upon my Cajun mother's advice and her attitude, I have learned how to work with people of different persuasions. And I believe that I can sit down in principle compromise with both sides and work things out for them. 49 years before the birth of Christ, a general in Italy named Julius Caesar was in Gaul, which was a province of Italy. Gaul was separated from the rest of the nation by a river, the Rubicon. Rubicon came from a Latin word, rubio, which meant, which had come from another word, which meant red, because the river had a red tint based upon the red soil on its banks. The rules at the time was that if a general crossed that river into the main body of Italy, he would be subject to execution. But Julius Caesar knew that the citizens of Italy under the Pompey rule were unhappy and not being fairly treated by government. So he took it upon himself with his legions to cross the river. Well, he did so. In spite of the fact that he was advised that his life might have been in jeopardy, but he was concerned about the country that he loved so much. So he crossed. The evening after he crossed, he looked back at the river and said in Latin to his lieutenant, Jacta Alea Est, the die is cast. Today, I cross the river. And it's symbolical that this red river has some reference to the red political condition in the 6th Congressional District, of which I'm aware. But I have no argument with that. I'm not one of those Democrats, which I am, who have some hard feelings towards Republicans. I don't like some of the things the right-wing Republicans stand for, as I don't like some of the things the left-wing Democrats stand for. This country and Edwin Edwards are in the middle accommodating the wishes and needs of everybody. I believe government is made to serve people. I'm concerned as I travel this state and this district that people seem dissatisfied that they're unable to get in touch with anybody. I could not tell you how many times people have told me I have this problem or that problem, but nobody will listen to me. I can't talk to anybody. And I would say, well, call your senator, call your representative, call the governor. <laughs> I get the same response. Nobody answers and nothing happens. But when I'm in Congress, you can call me. I may not be able to help you, but I'll take your call and I'll talk to you, just as I did in the 16 years I served this state as governor. Ladies and gentlemen, Jacta Elia is the die is cast. And I hope you will join with me in making this district a better district because we have that protection. Thank you. Governor, some, some pundits say the only reason you're going to run is to save Mary Landry's seat. Is that what you uh, tackle this race for? You have to save her seat? Yes, get the Democrats out, vote. Well, I assume that we will both benefit from our respective candidacies, but frankly, I thought for a long time, thought about running for her seat. <laughs> <laughs> I determined not to do it because I, I just don't want to have another statewide race, spend that much time with it. I have a beautiful child. I spend time with him. I have a beautiful wife who's very close to me. And by the way, who is a Republican? And that is one of the reasons I've learned to get along with Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. Uh, answer your question, I assume we'll help each other, but she's running her race and I'm running mine. 
and for the benefit of those of you who might have some interest, we have not discussed the race one way or the other. Not at all. Not one word. Governor. Beth? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Go ahead. Uh, Governor, tell me something. Are you, if you go to Washington, D.C. as a congressman, would you be willing to work on some campaign legislation to extend the term of Congress to four years? So the minute the person wins, they don't have to start fundraising again? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know that I want to, would want to get involved. That's a very sweeping uh, change in our national government, and I doubt whether or not it would apply. As a matter of fact, there's some, there's some jurisprudence and some uh, legal opinion that you cannot foreclose a person from running for Congress for the second, third, or fourth time because the Constitution gives the qualifications. And being a, a sitting congressman, no matter for how long, uh, does not disqualify you. And I doubt if you could do that. Frankly, lay it out. The only term limits I believe in are at the polls. When people get tired of that politician, they ought to vote them out, and that's their privilege. And it's kind of interesting to me that some of the greatest advocates of term limits end up running for something else when that term expires. If you're a House member and it expires, you run for Senate and vice versa. That's that privilege. But I don't believe in term limits except those that are exercised at the polls. Governor, no, no doubt you've taken a look at some of your opponents. Who would you consider? That? I said, no doubt you've taken a look at some of your opponents. Who would you consider your toughest and how has the fundraising been? The toughest opponent? Yeah. Frankly, I, I've only met uh, one of them very impressed with it. Uh, I will not <coughs> damage his campaign by saying who it is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that would be, a, in my estimation, at least 10 Republicans. So people would certainly have a longer list to go through. And uh, There are some people who don't like me. I understand that. <laughs> but uh, they'll have a good choice. And that's, of course, that privilege. Uh, one thing is pretty certain. I'll end up in the runoff with one of them. So. I have a habit of saying nice things about all of them because I don't know which one it would be. <laughs> Do you think the president should allow you a pardon should you make the runoff? What's that? Do you think the president should give you a pardon if you make the runoff? I never thought about that, but I, I don't think so. I don't think it would make much difference, frankly. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I don't think many people in the 6th District are waiting breathless for any, <laughs> breathlessly for anything. And incidentally, while you're on the subject, uh, um, I'll divert. I'm a big supporter of the Keystone Pipeline. Canada has this oil they want to sell us. We have the refining capacity in Louisiana and Texas and Kansas. We need the oil. If we don't buy it, the Chinese will buy it and ship it to China and make uh, TV sets and other things, including Mardi Gras beads, to sell to us at, ex at accelerated prices. And it's one thing that we can beat the Chinese at, and we ought to. Governor. Within Democrats on the national level, about your candidacy. Excuse me. Have you spoken with any Democrats on the national level about your candidacy? No, I have not. However, there are some Democrats in Louisiana who are in the political field who have discussed it with them. And they are waiting to see how many Democrats, if any, and I understand there's already one, uh, will qualify. That will make a difference upon their attitude. But I have not discussed it with them. Frankly, I've seen too many national organizations, both Republicans and Democrats, destroy a candidate in, in Louisiana because they don't know how we operate down here. I do. Governor, over here. How much money do you think you will need to have in your campaign war chest to wage a successful campaign? And do you expect difficulty getting people to write checks for you? It's certainly more difficult than when you run it for governor because there's very limited uh, effort that a, a congressman can make to help people. And, and, and many people support a governor because they're looking for something, uh, which is understandable as long as it's legitimate. Now, I expect that it will not be easy to get campaign contributions because uh, of, the, of the nature of the campaign and the limitations on the amount of money that people can give. 
but I'm not concerned about that. I don't have to raise money to get known, good or bad. 99% <laughs> of the people in this district already know me. And I doubt if a million dollars worth of television would change anybody's opinion of me. Uh, sometimes I'd like to change some opinions, but I have, I have to live with what I have. And I'm comfortable with my life. I'm comfortable with my record as a, as a governor. I'm comfortable with my attitude towards people. I get along with everybody. And I'm very pleased to let people judge me based upon what they know about me. Bottom line, I think, according to polls that I've seen, none of the uh, alleged candidates have more than a 10% uh, favorable identity rating in the, in the district. I have 99%. They will have to raise more money in order to get known than I will. But that might be to their advantage, maybe not. But I intend to spend more of my time and my effort organizing the campaign and getting a message across as to why I think I should be a panel congressman of this Freud and slip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why I should be congressman from this district. Governor, uh, along that line, you served as a congressman before. And as I recall, you said you didn't particularly enjoy that time in Washington, that you preferred being back in Louisiana, being governor. What's changed for you now that you would think you want to go to Washington? You didn't have anywhere else to go? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in Congress from 1965 to 1972 when I resigned to become governor. I acknowledge to you I did not enjoy my tenure, but I was very successful, evidenced by the fact that every time I ran for re-election I had no opposition or I won by 80 or 90 percent of the vote. I was very active and I did what I needed for my district. But Congress at that time was totally dependent on the seniority system. One had to be in Congress for years before he could get anything done. It's different now. The three leading candidates for the Republican nomination for president are all first termers. Mario, Cruz, and uh, Paul. And now it's more ability and accomplishment rather than tenure. However, to the extent that it matters, I will have an advantage over those other candidates because when I get to Congress, the prior service I have will in some measure benefit me, which is an advantage I have over them who have never had any experience. So the Louisiana Republican Party has already sent out a press release saying that your antics are fit for a reality show but not for public um, I'm what? Your antics. My antics? Yes, sir. You mean the things that got me elected so many times? <laughs> <laughs> those, those are my antics. And uh, <laughs> as usual, they will have a Democrat elected who will be helpful to them. How do you plan to win over Republicans in the 6th District? I'm going to let Trina talk to them. <laughs> 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 Look, a lot of farmers are Republicans. A lot of working people are Republicans. A lot of business people are Republicans. Legislators are Republicans. And I've been in touch with many of them, whom I will not name, who, in spite of their registration, are going to support me. It's not so much what you registered at, but what you stand for, what you can do, what you can accomplish. And I'm probably the only Democrat of note who has that attitude to Republic. I don't hate them. I don't dislike them. I don't spend my time denigrating them or trying to hurt them. I spend my time trying to help them and make things work for them as well as for Democrats. Governor, Governor, based on your time spent in federal prison, racketeering, bribery, extortion charges, how do you restore public trust, number one? And what do you say to those who feel that your candidacy for Congress is an embarrassment to the state. They said that last time I ran for governor. And uh, I don't know, uh, I hardly think it's an embarrassment to the state. It might be uh, 
something the state should be proud of because uh, forgiveness, understanding, second chances are important in life and in politics. Uh, and I think, I think that people will look at me, of course, one thing I'm going to tell you, as the campaign progresses, I'm going to make some effort to try to let people know what the trial was about. Contrary to public opinion, it had nothing to do with my being governor. There's nothing in the case that says I took a bribe as governor, nothing about me taking money from the people, nothing at all about me using my office to help my friends. It's all about things that happened a year after I was out of the governor's office based upon what some former friends said they thought I would do after I got out of the governor's office. I know that's hard to sell. I know people don't understand that, but that's a fact. <coughs> it, it isn't that I was convicted for illegally granting riverboat licenses. That is not correct. The one license that was in contest, the one that Bobby Gidry had, the Freds allowed him to keep it. Certainly didn't suggest that it was illegally obtained and he sold it for $105 million. Uh, that's, that's hardly correct, but I know that people feel that while I was governor, I did this, that, or the other. But let me say, without fear of contradiction, and the record is still there, Mary Jane sat through the whole trial. Lawyers have watched it and, and commented on it. It was not about Edwin Edwards, the governor. It was about Edward Ed, Edwin Edwards, who was a friend of people who, for reasons of their own, testified falsely about our relationship after I was in, out of the governor's office. Fact. Uh, you mentioned the beautiful wife and child. Uh, people will say, why not spend time with them as much time as you can with them instead of putting them through the rigors of a campaign? How difficult a decision was that from a personal standpoint? And I'd like to hear from Trina to see Oh, whether I'm in Washington or Pelican Point or in Mamu, I'll spend time with Trina because she'll be right with me wherever I go. She used to say it's because she didn't trust me, but now she does. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be together. I would not, honestly, no office in the, in the world would attract me if it meant separating from my child, my children, and my wife. Whether you believe it or not, this has brought us closer together, we work together, and she's looking forward to spending time with me wherever I am in the service of people of this district. Well, I sure appreciate it. Donovan, one last question. Can you foresee a situation where we have a repeat of 1991 with David Dukas in this race, we got a, a proud Republican film, and we get another runoff between you and David Duke. I don't know of anybody who's thinking about running who will come anywhere near being David Duke, <laughs> but if so, so be it. Uh, I hope he identifies himself as the campaign progresses. But uh, no, uh, you, you can have you have a, a, a wide array of Republican candidates already who have announced, and I'm sure there will be more. Uh, I can't at this moment comment on them because I don't know who would ultimately make the race. I heard yesterday that one who was talking about it has now said he's not going to run, and there'll be some who say they're not going to run who are going to talk about running. But I have touched the base of wherever I could to ascertain I, that's some people in the district that I would consider to be formidable candidates. They haven't surfaced yet, but they have not indicated a, a willingness to run or an intent to run. So I'm going to run my campaign. I know based upon the number of Republicans, which will divide the Republican vote, which is a substantial vote, that I will be in the runoff with one of them. And that's why the other 10 or 12 of them can expect me to be nice to them because I don't know which one is going to end up in the runoff. When did you reach your final decision? Uh, about five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I made a decision with Trina and my family about uh, a week and a half ago, and we started. Trina has already done all of the, uh, uh, with me, has already done all of the social media work. We passed out, a, I, I think you passed out the district. Oh, I thought you had already.
Yeah, yeah, I have problems with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a list here of, of uh, the social media uh, contacts. Uh, we couldn't get the phone number because uh, you're not believe this, but we've been trying now for a week to get the phone numbers, and they kept calling us back. But we found out this morning that they were using the wrong number, and so they didn't reach us. But we'll have the number probably sometime this afternoon. We've already uh, made arrangements to rent an office on Florida Boulevard, and uh, we're moving in that direction. We have a treasurer, we have a bank account, and uh, as of Friday, I sent the uh, uh, papers to the Federal Elections Commission indicating my intention to run. So, Governor, are you going to get Willie Nelson to come back and do another concert? What's that? You're going to get Willie Nelson again to do another concert for you? I might do that. That's good that's idea. <laughs> <laughs> when he sings on the road, road again, we won't have so far to travel. <laughs> but this is a good district, you know. It, it encompasses much of Point Capi, West Baton Rouge, Eberville, Assumption, and practically all of East Baton Rouge, and uh, also some of St. John and some of St. Charles, all the way down to some of Lafourche and Terrebonne Parish, and. Uh, I'm comfortable in the, in the, in the district. It's, it's, it's a good district for me, and I'm looking forward to it. Governor, when um, Victoria Reshi Kennedy campaigned for you, will you ask her? <laughs> Victoria Reggie Kennedy. Oh, uh, she, I'm, sure she would, I'm sure she would support me, but I haven't asked her. You know, her father died about... Uh, two months ago and I, the family's been in great uh, upheaval over it because it, they were very close. And uh, she lives up in, I think, Maine now, or Massachusetts. But uh, if she can help, and I'm sure she will, and as the campaign progresses, we look at that. I, I'm the kind of fellow who would take help from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I even had two people in the media offer to vote for me one time. <laughs> 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 but listen, and in, in, in appreciation and gratitude for your hosting this for me, I'm inviting all of you to a buffet luncheon, and you please enjoy yourself, and I'll see you on the campaign trail. <laughs>